in quantum field theory, the starting point is most often a Lagrangian density. Lagrangian densities provide the equation of motion for the degrees of freedom of a continuous medium, like the field of transverse displacements on a stretched string fixed at two end. The set of transverse displacements form a field quantity since they are defined for each horizontal coordinate x. For non-classical cases, the Lagrangian if often set up on the basis of reasonable experience and expectations about the presence of certain symmetries. The results are then compared with experiments to check whether the initial hunch about the structure of the proposed Lagrangian density were correct or not. In this lecture we would learn how to obtain the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion for classical continuous systems using the methods of functional calculus. Our aim in this lecture is to obtain the form of Euler-Lagrange equations for a continuous system or a field. We start with the definition of a function. A function is a black box which, in the simplest case, takes in a number, does something to it and puts out another number. A functional, on the other hand would accept a function and give out a number, in the next slide, we give two examples of functionals. The distance functional or the rectifier, for example, would accept the name of a function and return the arc length of the named function within the given range A to B. For example, if you send in a constant function, the rectifier functional just returns the length of the segment B minus A. Let me tell you at the outset that I have made up the name of this functional and you may not find this name in the standard literature. The at value functional accepts a function name and then return its value at a specific point x0. The input function name may change but x0 does not. As an example when x0 is pi by 2 and you send in the identity function which is just x you get back the number pi by 2, on the other hand, sending in the sine function results in the value 1. What is the value of the at value functional if the input function is 2x minus pi? A functional can be made to work somewhat like a function if we sample the function at various point and provide these samples to the input of an equivalent function which would then know how to construct the output by combining the samples. Consider, for example, the rectifier functional again. Its job is to take in a function, find out the derivatives at the sample points, calculate the little arc lengths and add them up together to provide the final result. The scheme would work perfectly when the number of samples become infinite and if this is the case, the description in terms of the function and the functional becomes exactly same. Imagine that the yi values grow a little or drop a little while each of them maintaining their standing positions xi. This changes the profile and a straight line can become a sine curve while maintaining the endpoints that is, YA and YB would remain the same. If we manage to express the variation of as a sandwiched integral form, the sandwich material, that is the material in between the two slices would stand right up as the functional derivative. The most general method of finding the functional derivative is thus to compute the functional increment and arrange it up in the sandwich form. The derivative marked in blue can then be read up as the functional derivative. In this example, we are going to find the derivative of the quadrature functional. To calculate the increment, change the ordinates at each point by delta y and calculate the increment in the area. Arranging the increment between the dx and the delta x we find that the functional derivative is the doubling function 2y. In this slightly advanced example, we calculate the derivative of the at value functional. In order to proceed, 
one should try the right hand side as a definite integral of something so that it fits into the scheme of things. This is easily achieved by a delta function. See, what we have meant when we said that each of y i the hold their foot positions. The delta functions are positioned at the same points while the y values change at each x point. In this and some future slides, we show that many general cases can be handled by just what we know about the most elementary case, the functional of a single function. A functional of two fillets, shown here just calls for partial functional derivatives in place of ordinary or total functional derivative discussed earlier. It really doesn't matter if the field argument depends on more than one spatial argument, as the functional derivative is with respect to the field and not with respect to the field coordinates. This functional does not look so simple, but is a quadrature integral, taking in a function and returning the value of a double integral which is again, just a number. The integrals that we write are actually defined over some bounded region although it may not look like it. The function that is to be integrated is deliberately written using the notation for Lagrangian density, which depends only on x and y through x in this case. In particular, it does not depend on the derivative of y. To calculate the functional derivative of EFF, we vary the field y to first order and pick up the derivative from the sandwiched form. When the functional have no dependence on the derivative of the field, the functional derivative is the same as the field derivative of the Lagrangian density. A direct example, hard enough to miss. This is the most important case. In the last line we write an approximate sign since Taylor series expansions have been used. The third term is new and it can be simplified by expanding through partial integration. In the last but one step, we assume that the field Y vanishes over the boundary. We have also interchanged the order of variation of Y with the act of local differentiation in that step. There are two operations, pulling up the ordinates which corresponds to the delta variation. The other one involves variation of the X coordinates and these can be carried out interchangeably. In this problem, the Lagrangian density can depend on the second derivative of the field as well. This would not be the case for the fields we would have to consider, but deriving the expression for the functional derivative is a nice exercise anyway. Only the derivative of the density with respect to y dash dash requires special handling and we trace it through rewriting the integral in a form suitable for partial integration, then doing it, using the fact that the first field derivative, like the field, also vanishes at the boundary etc etc till we obtain the effect due to this last term. Let us have a look at this Lagrangian which is written as an integral over a Lagrangian density, the density appropriate for describing waves on a stretched string fixed at both ends. Phi describes the transverse displacements, rho is the linear mass density and T is the tension in the string. The action integral S is the integral L dt. We compute the functional derivative of the action and set it to zero according to the principle of least action. There is no dependence on field, only on its derivatives. The equation of motion one gets is the equation describing waves on the string. This example is a canonical one in that it establishes trust in the methodology of functional calculus through a familiar example. It is perhaps remarkable to see how the wave equation falls right through the formalism but one point needs consideration. It is that the form of the Lagrangian density indeed fell through the roof. In quantum field theory, the form of the Lagrangian density is often proposed. While it must have justification through prior experience and demands of symmetry but not much else. Like all of physics, the end result should describe the real world and needs empirical validation. Let us generalize things just a little bit more. In this case we are looking at a Lagrangian whose density depends on the field and its spatial derivatives. 
the functional derivatives of the Lagrangian therefore contains two more terms due to the y and z dependences, but nothing fundamentally new. There is no direct dependence on the field coordinates, this is mostly true for the densities that we would need to consider. The reason is that the underlying physics should not depend on the point where it is taking place. In other words, these theories respect the homogeneity of space and conserve angular momentum. Including temporal derivatives would not be problem either, should we need it as it can be included just like the spatial derivative and we have already done it or the wave equation. We write down the results for such a field using covariant notation in the next frame. The Lagrangian density in field theory in general can be written in this form which involve dependence on field, all of its spatio-temporal derivatives but not explicitly on any field coordinates. This is nothing new, and we have already seen what its equation of motion would look like. The covariant notation, emphasizes the uniformity of treatment of space and time coordinates and is also a compact way to write things down. We would however write down the equation of motion not right now, but after we recognize that the density can be a function of several fields, not just one. For that case, there will be one equation for each component field. Fields like the Maxwell field or the Dirac field are multi-component in nature. For these fields there would be one equation per component and that is what the index I stands for. For a single component field you can just erase the index off. The last equation of motion, encircled in a red box is the final equation that we need for the rest of the course. With that, adios for now, but you may want to look at the last slide anyway.